Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Uh, this is the place where we're talking about how businesses are building resilience in this very strange time that we're living in. Um, before we continue, support for NPR in this series comes from Block Advisors. It's a team within H&R Block. Uh, running a small business is hard, and taxes shouldn't have to make it any harder. Block Advisors' goal is to help keep things easy. Their professionals take care of taxes, bookkeeping, and payroll. It's backed by a 100% accuracy guarantee to help small business owners stay focused on what they love. In-person and virtual filing options are available. You can get started today at blockadvisors.com. Thank you again for your support. Okay, my guest today, I'm super excited about this, is Vivian Ku. Vivian owns three Taiwanese restaurants in Los Angeles, which I haven't been to yet, but when I go to Los Angeles, you you have to know I'm going to be like there at seven in the morning, hours before the door is open to eat the eat there. Um, one of which is a breakfast pop up um, today uh, starts here. She just opened it last year in Chinatown in L.A. Um, we're going to talk about her path to opening restaurants and how she's adapted during the pandemic. It's been a really tough time, especially for people in the service industry and restaurant industry. Vivian, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, before we get into it, anybody watching, you can submit questions for Vivian, any questions you have about the restaurant industry, about Taiwanese food, whatever you want to ask. Um, you can submit those through Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or however you want to do it. Um, so Vivian, um, I, I don't, I don't hope, hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but before we get into it, um, I mean, it's just a, it's been a crazy um, especially crazier um, for the Asian American community, and and and, and certainly um, the last twenty four hours, what, what happened, um, you know, in Atlanta, and and just a, a renewed focus on this this crazy um, violence that has hit the Asian American community all over the United States. Um, how, how are you doing? How are you just kind of absorbing all this stuff? Um, I spent a lot of yesterday. Um, I always, when I hit something I don't understand, try to process it and try to process it in a way where there's a silver lining. And I really had a hard time yesterday. I was like, there is no mm -hmm. silver lining here. Um, you know, I couldn't really make sense of it. It felt like in a lot of ways we were going backwards, like worse than when I was growing up. And, hmm. uh, you know, part of the reason why I wanted to share Taiwanese food because it's part of my culture. And I think, you know, having it shared with a wider audience, I think it's really, there's something I really enjoy out of having people kind of be more open-minded or learn something about someone's culture just because they wanted a great bite to eat. I think it's a, such a human thing. Um, and that's been a lot of the joy of running the restaurant. I remember seeing this like white nine-year-old boy come in to order wood your mushroom salad to bring to his classroom. Hmm. Um, and it was his birthday and I was like, I was trying to bring in cupcakes to fit in and we've come so far. And then yesterday yeah. it was like, that is completely the opposite. And it's just, um, I did try to see a little bit. The only thing I can see from here is that, you know, it's not represent, you know, it's, it's a few bad actors that make the whole thing seem extra, extra bad. Um, I do believe that humans are good <laughs> and that that's not, speaking for everyone, you know, it's not representative of the whole entire picture. Um, and I think hopefully we'll be better allies for one another. I know, you know, during the summer um, when BLM was going on, you know, I think a lot of kids my generation had to explain to, you know, our parents and um, aunts and uncles, like what it was all about. And I think, you know, this will all band all of us together and hopefully also realize that, you know, it's very, um, like we're, we all have a role to play here and whether it's, you know, more people feeling like they need to enter into their, you know, local politics or be involved, I think, you know, um, but it's really hard to make sense of it. And yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of the conversations, certainly in the last year and certainly in the last few months, um, have been about representation and and the impact that representation has on 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 empowering people, right? And and that's what you do through your restaurants. I mean, you you whether consciously or unconsciously, you're bringing, as you say, um, this your 
your your heritage and your culture um, and your family's culture through food to people in in the Los Angeles area. Tell me how you um, I know you started with a restaurant called Pine and Crane in Silver Lake um, in in L.A. Um, tell me how you how you came to that 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 place. How did you um, how did you how did you first decide to open up a Taiwanese restaurant? Um, it was mostly I knew I wanted to open a restaurant and it didn't have to be necessarily Taiwanese food. I just really liked the idea of creating a place and having people come together. I like the energy of a restaurant um, and I like the idea of running a restaurant. But Taiwanese food made a lot of sense because, you know, ultimately um, it's the food that I hold most near and dear my heart. And then also I felt like it was um, very underrepresented at the time. Um, but had so much to offer. Um, you know, I always like to say that Taiwanese food is organically designed to appeal to the masses because of the way, you know, history um, and migration, you know, with all food kind of like shaped its culinary history and where it's going. Um, so it just made a lot of sense to me to, you know, share something that I'm from. And then also um, it seemed like it was something that, you know, could be shared with more people. Yeah. Um, I'm curious for, for people who don't know, I mean, probably the most famous, I think to, to, to non-Taiwanese folks, um, Taiwanese cuisine is beef noodle soup, right? I mean, it's fair to say like, that's like sort of the, 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 the thing that most people know or bow, um, um, sandwiches. Tell me a little bit about the food that you make at your restaurants. Yeah. So, um, Pine and Crane, you know, uh, it has a very heavy Northern Chinese influence on the menu um, because you have uh, my maternal side. Um, they went from mainland China to Taiwan in 1949 when there was a civil war. Um, and they came from this region um, where, you know, they ate a lot of wheat because wheat was um, the yeah. main agricultural product. So um, a lot of like dumplings, buns, pot stickers, and my grandmother mm -hmm. would always joke about how, you know, they would move over to Taiwan and then all of a sudden they were native, uh, they were neighbors with native Taiwanese and how like all the neighbors would kind of want, want to come over and learn like how to make these things because it was more of a rice-based diet. Right. And like for Michelli made it from noodles, uh, rice, no rice instead of noodles um, made from wheat. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think Taiwanese food just has a lot of different influences because, you know, you have the Aborigines, you have migrations from uh, China in earlier years, you have the Japanese occupation for 50 years where they thought they would have the island forever. Um, right. And then you have 2 million people from all over China, such a large landmass kind of gather together onto this island and all become neighbors with one another. So I think it makes for you know, a very interesting, uh, you know, culinary melting pot. So, yeah. yeah. You, you grew up um, in Bakersfield, California, which is like the kind of the capital of America's bread, uh, you know, sort of food basket, right? Bakersfield and, and, and Modesto, like these are Fresno. These are like sort of the big cities in the Central Valley of California that grows like 70% of, of all fruits and vegetables in the United States. Um, Tell me about, about, I mean, where, was your family in the, in, in the agriculture industry? Yeah. Um, so we actually moved to Bakersfield for that reason. So when I was around five or six, um, my dad decided to buy a farm and we all moved over. And, you know, the earlier years when he, especially when he was growing all sorts of stuff, that was when I was a lot younger. So a lot of memories are, you know, planting seeds and like harvesting and playing with plants and things like that. And it was really nice. Um, but then, you know, school started and then I became probably less and less involved over time. But I also started to sort of, I think, grow up and kind of see like, oh, this is a really hard industry. And like my parents would have to try and there were, you know, definitely rough years in there. But um, I think ultimately, you know, they, they ran a small business. A lot of people in my family own small businesses, not necessarily in food. Um, and I did like how, you know, even in a moment of difficulty, um, they ultimately got to decide what was the best response. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in Bakersfield. Yeah. And um, I mean, how did you, because I know you went, you went and studied at Harvard and, um, and so I have to assume you're a pretty good student in high school and, and um, 
how did you decide to to go into the restaurant industry? Because I have to imagine that there probably were people, maybe even your parents, who were like Vivian. This is nuts. This is like the 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 most unstable, like the scariest thing to go into. Did did you get any any kind of pushback like that? A little bit, sure. Um, I think you know I originally went into the industry because of all you know some of the very basic reasons like everyone else like I loved food I loved going out to eat I loved creating something I loved how people how people are generally very happy when you feed them and I was like that's a good way to make a living um but I think you know I didn't get as much of that I think as a lot of you know um I think Asian American kids especially got um my grandfather was is probably my one of my favorite humans ever um he was just had so much oomph and uh, was a very principled person. Um, some of them like his his principles and sometimes questionable, but he was he stuck to them. And I remember from a very early age, you know, he would say something like along the lines of, you know, there are no inferior jobs, only inferior people. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you do; it's how you do it. Yeah. Um, and I think that message was really powerful to me at a young age because I think you know it sort of gave me the first hint where it's like, you know, the things society value are sometimes not necessarily correct. Um, and that if I were stuck in a situation, it's my response to it that truly mattered. Um, I remember a time when I like, I don't know, got second place in a math competition or something and, you know, was a little bit grumpy and, you know, my grandfather was like, okay, what's going on? And um, I was like, oh, I got second place. I thought I would have gotten first. And he, his response was like, oh, first place is for losers anyways. And I'm like, <laughs> it's not a very grandfatherly response, I uh -huh. think, um, and not what you would expect. Um, and I would get first place and then I was like the best in his eyes still. But um, I think he was someone who thought like you didn't need to be first place in life to be someone admirable and that there's like so much more to a person um, than just getting first place. Tell me about um, when you decided to, to open your first restaurant. Now you've got two plus a pop up, so three. How did you? I mean, how did you? I mean, it's, it takes a lot of courage to start anything, right? And I'm and I and I'm and I'm, I have to imagine that you probably were a little nervous because we and you did start the first restaurant in 2014. Um, were you nervous? What what was what 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 were the anxieties you had about about opening it up? I think fear of failure was huge. Yeah. Um, you know, I um, convinced my parents to let me go to culinary school, and then um, they were. I'm so grateful to them, but you know, they actually said, you know, we will support you in this endeavor. And you know, I had borrowed money from my parents, my aunts. Um, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband. And, you know, I, I like borrowed this money and I was ready to go. And, you know, it was about time to sign the lease. And at that time I was like not sleeping well. I like had lost some weight and um, just was very shaky. And um, my mom was pretty much just like, okay, well, what happens if you don't do this? And yeah. then I think, you know, it's risk minimizing, uh, regret minimization. You know, I was literally uh, thinking about it and I said, I think I would cringe slightly every single time I step foot inside a restaurant. And then she was like, OK, well, then you have to do it. Um, so for me, though, it's kind of, you know, and then once you sign the lease, you know, sometimes it's just like that one thing to get yeah. through. Then it's You're too right. late to back out. And then you just pretty much have to focus on, OK, well, how am I going to make it successful? So it's yeah. sometimes just that that little push. Last this past year, I, I have to imagine has been by far and away the most challenging year of your professional life, and maybe even of your your life. Um, this 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 pandemic has hit restaurants so so hard, um, and there's some estimates that like almost half of, of the restaurants in the United States sh will shut down or will permanently close. Um, and I don't know if that's accurate, but there's some estimates that say that. Tell me about. Um, the impact of the past year. I mean, you, you're in, you're in Los Angeles. Los Angeles at one point was the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, how, how challenging was it for you to, to survive the past year, to, to, for the business to survive? Um, we've had a lot of ups and downs. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we had closed and I had 
especially banked on a PPP loan that turned out like I, I didn't make it the first round. Um, so I was super worried. And I think overall, um, we've had, I think it's not lost on me that, you know, had we been in fine dining or had we been a bar, our journey so far would have been many times more difficult. And I think a lot of that just comes down to luck. You know, we happen to be in a segment of the industry that's a little bit more price point friendly, a little bit more takeout friendly. Um, so it's been a lot of ups and downs. Um, you know, we closed for roughly two months and then we came back. And when we first came back, it was actually great. Um, a lot of people showed up and people were gen really generous with gratuity and the team was doing well. And um, then we started to navigate into um, this period of time when we started to have, you know, a lot of cases of COVID all around us. So then we yeah. had to start getting tested on site every single week and decide, you know, there was not really a lot of guidance. So every single time we would have to come together and sort of check in with everyone on the team and see where they were at and decide, you know, what was the best thing for everyone involved. So the entire team, the restaurant, you know, we try to be open for the community as well. Um, but it was a lot of coming together over and over again, being like, what is the best decision now? What is the best decision now? Yeah. Um, and then now as we're opening back up, I think, you know, everyone has a little bit of concrete hope, especially because most of our team have had their first vaccination shots. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone is so tired. <laughs> Um, everyone's yeah. running out of steam and it's been over a year and we haven't really, you know, you just keep going and there hasn't been opportunity, there haven't been opportunities to recover. Um, so I think, you know, everyone will need a really good vacation, but my hope is that we just push through. Um, yeah. and as things open up, you know, we don't have, we're holding off on indoor dining and, um, we'll open up outdoor dining at Pine and Crane soon, but we don't have outdoor dining at joy so the road back is a little bit unclear at this moment yeah. for us um so yeah almost over but not quite <laughs> almost over yeah um you did something that sounds seems a little counterintuitive which is in october so really you know as the pandemic was still raging and then it would it would become worse especially in los angeles you opened a a, a breakfast pop-up restaurant um, called Today Starts Here. And it's been really successful. Um, was that the plan? Did you have the plan to do this? Or did was that kind of born out of just the the situation with the pandemic? Did you just think, you know, let's open up a, a pop up a breakfast restaurant? Yeah, um, I think, you know, when you look at it, it seems like we've expanded during the pandemic. Um, but we did sort of downscale like from our original plans, February, 2020 was a super exciting time for us. Um, you know, I had finished signing a lease that I had personally guaranteed. Um, and then we were in the middle of this um, lease for Chinatown that is today starts here. We were almost done. Um, and I was looking at a different spot and we had a week where we were like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. We'll be working on maybe as many as five projects by the end of the year. Um, and then the pandemic hit and then, you know, immediately it was like, well, let's push all of that away. Um, but, you know, we had already started the conversation of like, oh, who would we promote to be a manager on our team? And we've already had those conversations and yeah. who would we move to Chinatown to run this project? Um, so we took a break for two months, but when we came back, you know, and I was able to talk to the landlord and be like, look, can we try like a month to month situation? Um, you know, there's a lot of downsides to opening during a pandemic, but there's a lot of upsides too. Um, you know, because no one came inside, we can kind of just, you know, we just scrub down the space, bought, put some old and new pieces of equipment together um, and got to start up rather quickly, um, mm -hmm. quicker than we normally would have been able to. Um, and then I think people were also very understanding given it was a pop up in a pandemic. Yeah. It kind of allowed us to really keep our entire team, promote people who we were, had planned on promoting um, also was there's a lot of benefits to having a bigger team at a separate location. So coverage, if we needed, was a little bit easier. Um, so I think it had a lot of value for us um, to try to just be in that space. And then um, we're definitely, you know, if I think once things calm down a little bit, we still have a lot of work to do there because um, we didn't really, you know, we will we'll have to build out the space and think about how to be there in a more sustainable yeah. manner. Ha has that model, though, that pop-up model, um, 
and this, almost kind of like an informal model, like what we're doing now, this resilience series, we started this last year and when the pandemic uh, hit. And, you know, I, I, if you told me two years ago, I'd be sitting in a, in, in a, in a studio, uh, my, my studio, you know, n near my house with some lights and, and, and my iPhone camera talking to people about uh, <laughs> I'm interviewing them for how I built this, I would be like, what? But we did it and, it, and it's been really great. We've learned so much um, about the show and about our audience by doing this. By doing that pop-up restaurant, I have to imagine you learned a lot about what, what, what could work and what might be more efficient in, in your business, right? Because it's just breakfast. You're only focused on breakfast and it's a pop-up. So presumably there's room to do the kinds of experimentation that you might not be able to do as easily in a brick and mortar location with critics coming in and all kinds of pressure. Is that, am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to having it be a pop up. I think, you know, um, for it to run, it's definitely not profitable on running breakfast alone. So we'll have to figure out something there in the longer term. Yeah. Um, and I do think, um, especially during the pandemic, a lot of people have been very entrepreneurial and like cooking out of, you know, their homes and sharing pop up kitchens. And I think ghost kitchens were already part of the industry before this all ha happened. And I think, will be a bigger part of the industry. Um, I'm not as interested in ghost kitchens because you lose so much of the things that draw me, um, drew me to the hospitality industry yeah. in the first place. Um, but it's true, like um, we were thinking, you know, if we did breakfast in the morning and um, then at night the space is available, um, if anyone on our team wanted to do a pop-up, that would be a really good opportunity. Um, so we really wanted to pursue this because there's just so much potential. Um, we're not really sure what it is yet, but it's like we can put our heads together and think of creative things that we can do to make things work. Um, so. You know, the, the, I think the assumption is that restaurants really make their, their margins on alcohol, right, inside of a restaurant. I don't know if that's true for all restaurants. And you mentioned it's hard to make a profit off breakfast alone, right, because it's it's relatively inexpensive compared to a, uh, you know ordering a few courses at dinner we're getting some questions from um from viewers including people clearly in the in the industry who, who are looking for advice uh, matthew asks um what is your profit margin per meal and per day that you need to hit in order to keep the business afloat or or even profitable profitable um or let's just say a float, like what, what kind of profit yeah. margin do you have to hit? I mean, I think it depends on the concept, right? Like yeah. I think, you know, traditionally we run on margins under 10%, probably closer to wow. eight for the pine and cream and joy, wow. which given the volume, it does give us some wiggle room. Um, today starts here. We haven't been able to hit break even from the very beginning. Um, I think the week that we got the LA times right up, we almost hit break even, um, maybe hit break even. Um, but, it's very labor intensive. So it kind of depends on the concept. And you mentioned alcohol earlier, you know, we're a, more of a fast casual spot. So people usually only get, you know, one drink. Um, right. And it's sort of, we, we see it kind of as we want them to have the full experience. So if they want a beverage to go with their meal, then we want that to happen. Um, so it doesn't have as large of an impact. Um, but I think overall, um, something's got to give. So I think for us, we're very labor heavy. Um, and then um we really have to manage our food costs and rent and other expenses yeah yeah vivian you know i i i keep hearing about the travel industry and and if you by the way just out of curiosity i looked i happened to look at airline stocks the other day as a as a gauge to see where they are and they're at 52 week highs right delta and united and jeff they're all at because there's an anticipation that people are going to flood the zone over the next few months as more and more of us are vaccinated i'm not yet so I shouldn't say us, but as more and more people are. Um, this is a question from Oliver, and, a, and it's a counterintuitive question, but it's an interesting question. I mean, do you think that in some strange way now might be a, a good time to think about opening a restaurant because the country will reopen and people are just going to go crazy, wild when they're freed from, from you know, being separated from others? Um. I mean, my hope is that the Restaurants Act will help a lot of people who had, you know, 
lost their opportunities during this time or really struggled, especially those in fine dining. My hope is that they'll be able to come back because I think once again, like we would have had a much harder time had we been in that space. Um, and a lot of them were places that were more well-managed, more loved, had better teams, maybe better food and all those things. And so my hope is that they get to come back. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, sometimes in the event that, you know, they don't get to come back, my hope is that, you know, there will be new a new generation of restaurants that'll pop up from this. I think, you know, um, sadly, there might be a lot of inventory available on the market. Yeah. So it is a good time to start um, a place. And I think, you know, you kind of um, have learned sort of like, okay, these, you, you, I think a lot of people have endured this pandemic, right? So there's the fact that you can make it through and then start something kind of, you're almost more confident going into it because you've seen yourself go through something difficult. Yeah. Um, so um, I think it'll come back. And I think maybe, maybe this is too optimistic, but, you know, people have been really creative in their homes and like, um, so I, I, I've spoken to several people who are starting concepts. So um, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Vivian, um, it's so, so cool because cool people, a lot of people watching are 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 in your in your industry, and really, um, and I, I hope this is helpful. So thank you um, for watching. This is um, Vernon from Vernon. Um, Vernon asks via Facebook, as a fellow food food business owner in Los Angeles, Vernon uh, owns Offset Coffee Company and Pinky's Hot Box. Vernon asks, um, what what are some interesting ways that you found to drive additional traffic to the restaurants while also better managing expenses? We actually have not focused a ton on that during this pandemic, <laughs> probably as much as we should have. I think when the pandemic happened, but when we came back um, in May, um, towards the end of May, we changed out our um, point of sale system to make it more contact, you know, contactless and also just a better system overall. Um, so that was helpful. And then we got on a lot of different delivery platforms because we're like, okay, well, it's takeout and delivery now. Um, but other than that, I think so much of it has, you know, so much of my energy has been on like, what's the best thing to do next and like keeping the morale of the team going, um, trying to make it through. It was kind of like, you know, as long as we make it through and we have most of the team intact, um, I think especially like have them it's okay, I think, if we're all a little bit physically tired, but not be also mentally drained. So, you know, trying to keep everyone's spirits in somewhat decent shape. Um, we haven't really thought much about how to reach, I guess, more people. Yeah. Vivian, when you think about this past year and, and what you've learned as a, as a manager, as a leader, I mean, I mean, this year must have been a crash course for you as a leader because there's no playbook, right? There's no handbook. No one says, hey, Vivian, in five years, there's going to be a pandemic. Here's the playbook. Just follow the playbook. You got to write it as you're going along. What, what is something that you want to take with you that, that you have learned about yourself as a, as a leader and, and maybe applied to your, to your businesses that you want to keep, keep going once, once we are back in sort of some, some version of normal? Um, yeah, no, I've been so appreciative of everyone who's trusted me to make these calls along the way you know a lot of i think the team just really showed up and um i think it was important that i was able to make sure that they felt that i had their best interest um so i'm i'm really grateful i think one takeaway is that you know it has to make sense for everyone um you know like a, a business i think is good so long as everyone who is helping it grow benefits. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's it's making sure that we grow in a way um, if, you know, or are on a trajectory in which um, we sort of live up to that because, you know, it's a really, it's very much a team endeavor. Like there's, I like knew that going in, right? Like everyone knows like back of house is important, front of house is important, everyone on the team is important. Um, but you really, I really couldn't have made it through alone and it's it's a team endeavor. 
Vivian Ku, owner uh, of Pine and Crane, uh, Joy, and today starts here three Taiwanese restaurants in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Vivian, I'm gonna be in LA once I'm vaccinated because my whole my mom, dad are there, and and can I can I have breakfast with you at your restaurant? Absolutely, I'm so looking forward to that. We're gonna do that. I'm gonna. Ha I can't wait. My first Taiwanese breakfast because I've never been to Taiwan. I'd love to go to Taiwan so much. So that's we're gonna do that. Um, thank you everybody for watching. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we go. Really important, especially if you're an entrepreneur. We, and, and even if you're, especially if you're an early stage entrepreneur, we just announced our 2021 How I Built This Fellowship program. We're gonna select 10 up and coming entrepreneurs who will join us for business building workshops and mentorship. We're gonna connect you with entrepreneurs who have been on this show, like some of the biggest names in the world. Um, you will pitch, 10 of you will pitch your ideas to a team of panels, uh, to, a team of, to a panel of judges, including me and people like Jenny Britton Bauer of Jenny's Ice Cream and Eric Ryan, who founded Method, and Tristan Walker, who founded Bevel. It's amazing. One winner will be selected. We will give you a, a $50,000 grant to start your business or launch your business. Um, it's sponsored by GoDaddy. They're supporting this fellowship. It's an amazing opportunity. You can apply for this by going to summit.npr.org slash fellows. This is the biggest thing at this level we have ever done, NPR has done. You gotta check it out. Also, we announced uh, that um, our summit is now open. <laughs> we are gonna have a How I Built This Summit uh, this year. It's virtual. Normally we do it in San Francisco and people come and it's it's great but this year it's virtual so anyone around the world can come it's much much cheaper i think tickets start at 50 bucks we're gonna have four days of incredible conversations so we got Brene brown and gary v and adam grant and rashad robinson and we've got sal khan and tristan walker and troy carter and i mean i'm on and on just the the people who are coming to the summit who will speak at the summit and i'll be interviewing a lot of them it's incredible. So it's well worth your time checking it out. Again, that's summit.npr.org. You get your tickets there, so check it out. Uh, if you are looking uh, for more stuff about the food industry, we actually released an episode on Monday about a company called Siete Foods. It is the biggest Mexican-American paleo food company in America. They were started like uh, seven or eight years ago by the Siete, fam uh, by the Garza family. All seven of them, which is why it's called Siete Family Foods. It's such a cool story. So check it out. It's on the podcast queue. If you're not a subscriber, you can find How I Built This wherever you get podcasts. Also, if you are a fan of the show, we have a book called How I Built This. It's called How I Built This, just like the show. It is available everywhere. Um, it is useful for entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs alike, people just kind of looking for creative ideas. So check it out. Vivian, thank you again. Thank you all for watching. We will thank see you, you back here next week.